Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update. Second part thereof is going to be second of three because there's too much stuff for both the military aid and the geopolitics segment to do in the same video. Um, it's just the nature of the beast today. Uh, sorry this is a little bit late as well. Right, we'll go to the Ramstein, which is one of the reasons there's an awful lot to talk about. The Ramstein meeting and Lloyd Austin, US Defense Secretary, who calls on Kiev's allies during the 17th Ramstein format meeting to strengthen Ukraine's air defences ahead of the coming winter months. So I think what's going on is that allies and Ukraine are saying, right, the number one thing we need is air defence. And the reason that, that the reason for that is because if we sort out the country internally and keep it safe, then the country can keep functioning and that pr creates a foundation to, to produce a, a, a decent armed services that or armed, armed service that can then go out and do the military stuff. If it's like, right, we're going to concentrate 100% on the front line and stuff like this here and there, then that leaves your the, the internal cities of the nation to be hit by cruise missiles and Shahid drones and would would render everything a bit pointless in terms of doing the fighting over here because you haven't got a country over here or the entire infrastructure, energy infrastructure, food infrastructure, civilian infrastructure has been debilitated. So it's like, right, we need to sort this out. And once we've got a solid network of, of equipment here, then we can talk about what needs it's not either or it's like both and then we can talk about how how to succeed on the battlefield and I, i'm fairly sure that's what's going on uh zelensky said about the ramstein meeting there are new packages of support for ukraine our soldiers this applies to shells missiles electronic warfare drones and new capabilities for our air defense a corresponding coalition has been created the coalition for the development of air defense the leaders in this of the, in its organization are germany and france and i say thank you for such leadership interesting okay let's get a bit more detail this is coming from defense of ukraine so five takeaways from ramstein 17th Ukraine Defense Contact Group Meeting. Ukraine is grateful to our partners for supporting in the fight against Russian aggression. Every shell is a chance to destroy enemy positions. Okay, one. So one of five outcomes. A new ground-based air defense coalition has been formed. Germany and France took leadership. The coalition includes 20 countries providing our cities with additional air defenses. One of the priorities for this winter. So priority for the winter because of the energy infrastructure and the country needs energy in order to function. So air defense is your number one two the netherlands has prepared two billion euros for military aid to ukraine that's massively significant however we'll be talking quite a lot about the netherlands because they've just had an election and it's not looking too good for ukraine because the far right is looking at getting in although there needs to be a coalition so it could be a bit funky and they they aren't big supporters of well they're not big supporters of the eu and Netherlands is one of the founder members of the EU. Then, so Gert Wilders is PVV, not big, big on the EU, not big on Ukraine support. So we're seeing this resurgence around the world of this kind of thinking, and it's a challenge to democracy. It's a challenge to Ukraine. Right. So that's that's good if that gets through, and I think it probably will. And we'll talk about it later. So three. As a result of yesterday's visit by the German Minister, Minister of Defense, Germany has already announced $1.4 billion uh, of, in an aid package, which includes four Iris T systems, 8,000 new anti tank mines, one Patriot system, 155 mil uh, artillery ammunition. It will arrive in Ukraine by mid December. This is massive. Four Iris T is huge. If that's another Patriot, that's really good because you can talk about Kiev being safe now, and if they're getting that one from Germany and another five from Raytheon and others from elsewhere, maybe, I don't know. But they bought five from Raytheon. I don't know when they are coming. I'm pretty sure one must be on the way or very close or already there or something. But you can start thinking where to place these other Patriot systems. Now, maybe Lviv, maybe Kharkiv, but actually I would like to see these Patriot systems be used cleverly near, nearer the front line to allow the Ukrainian Air Force to become more um, active and successful and to keep the Russian air defense air force back further. So anyway, significant from Germany again coming up with the Trumps. Uh, four, the leader of the IT coalition, Estonia, provides funding for $500,000 for the activities of the IT coalition, in addition to Luxembourg's commitment of 10 million euros. 
again, I talk about this being a positive sum game. So it's not gain. It's not about charity to Ukraine. So when Estonia and Luxembourg are giving money for IT coalition infrastructure and work, it is, what's it for? It is for largely going to be combating Russian disinformation and hybrid warfare. We're in a, we're in a fifth generation war now where it's a fight as much over the information space as it is for territory on the battlefield. And if Estonia and Luxembourg can help with, with in that context, then they'll also be helping themselves and Europe at large in terms of fighting the threat of Russian disinformation. Right. Five, the UK and Norway within the framework of the Maritime Coalition will look for ways to further strengthen security in the Black Sea. This is something the UK has already been playing a role in with regard to underwriting war risk insurance uh, and the rise of the costs for that for Ukrainian grain export. So UK going to continue doing that with Norway, two big maritime nations. Those are the five big takeaways from, from Ramstein. Okay, Andrew Perpetua, and with regard to air defences, has a bit of a rant, and I think it's well justified. Watching the cluster bombs, so just what's he talking about? I showed you a video of a massive cluster bomb uh, exploding a Russian cluster bomb that looked like an aerial guide aerial bomb, obviously, uh, but one of these guided glide bombs that's also a cluster variant, and a big old piece of kit it was. So watching the cluster bombs Russia now drops is infuriating to me. It highlights the failures of the West to supply the ne necessary air defence and deterrence. It and it shows how the West is constantly escalating this war by refusing to supply these weapons. Air defence for cities is nice, I guess, but air defence for the military matters more. Uh, this means fighter jets, and it, again, I would say, actually, both matter. Um, and it means deterrence. By deterrence, I mean long-range missiles that can strike deep into Russia and destroy their air force. Failing to supply this is escalatory, because it means Russia will escalate by uh, doing more and more of these, you know, using these terrible weapons that... Interestingly, they weren't so much previously earlier in the war because I don't think they're really prepared properly for a war. Um, yeah, Ukraine just needs to be given everything they need. Uh, the people who claim they want peace should be the ones clamoring the loudest to supply Ukraine with as many long-range weapons as possible, as quickly as possible, to destroy every single Russian airbase within Russia, certainly all of them west of the, uh, of the Urals. Anything less than this is both escalating the use of force and prolonging the war. Every day that passes where Russia has an intact air force is a day that Russia uses this air force to murder civilians. And like today in Kupiansk, uh, Vuzlovy, where they dropped bombs on civilians this morning. We need to be providing Ukraine with thousands of long-range cruise missiles. It needs to ensure that every working airfield in Russia, that every single plane and helicopter is destroyed. Anything less than supplying these weapons is an escalation in this war and brings us one step closer to a larger, more, much more deadly war. The whole Russian policy here is to fill a power vacuum. If you do nothing, they fill the power vacuum themselves. If you go in and fill it, they back down. Russia knows they cannot compete with us, but they are convinced we will not compete with them. Show them we will. The weaker you are, the more they will do. You have to show strength to wait, make this stop. This is so important and so on the money. Perpetua's nailed it there. And we, but we've all been saying this, or most of us have been saying this for a long time, which is give them everything you can and give it now because the Russians claim there are red lines, but those red lines are uh, basically non-existent. In reality, they back down. Uh, but if, if, if you don't do that, a prolonged war fully plays into the hands of the Russians, of the, of, of the Kremlin and of Putin. Just we just need to do more and quicker. And especially the longer it goes on, the more fatigued the West becomes and the more chance you've got of having governments get in like Robert Fitzo in Slovakia, like Geert Wilders in the Netherlands, like perhaps Trump in the US. And these people are not going to be in favour of supporting Ukraine. And that will lead to long-term global instability. Just, it's such a threat, this. Right, going back to Germany, and long may Germany continue doing this, but then you look at AFD and, and the horizon and think, goodness me, are they going to keep uh, gaining in popularity? And as Russia stokes the fires of disinformation, 
uh, and stokes the fires of nationalist sentiment. And while there's immigration on on the immigration issues on the periphery of, of the EU, of Europe, it's very easy for Russia to stoke those fires and get in governments who are going to be on, on the surface of it reacting to immigration issues. But un, under the bonnet, they're going to be doing stuff that is to the benefit of Russia and not to the benefit of Ukraine. German military aid to Ukraine updated with 20 MARDA IFVs, one Vicent, uh, that's a mine clearing vehicle, uh, two HX-81 and two semi-trailers for the HX-81 uh, logistics, five Bronco 80 TC ambulances, two Mercedes-Benz Unimog ambulances, nine vehicles, 2,380 shells uh, and 2,482 crypto, 28 crypto phones. Uh, good to see that all being sent or being pledged by um, by Germany. Excellent. Now, Bulgarian Parliament finally approves, this has been on the cards, on the cards, on the cards, the provision of armoured vehicles, 100 of them to Ukraine. These are old. These are like 1960s APCs, but they are certainly going to be useful. Um, it's, it's not necessarily something that needs to be top of the range. So you've seen a lot of the usage of the M113, old school APCs, getting used for medivacs, getting used to transport pe people behind the front lines, also at the front lines. Um, if it's just transporting people, it's less important that they've got like fire control systems and this and that because they don't have the weaponry on them. They're just APCs to get people from A to B. Now, they might not be the best armoured APCs, and that is a challenge, but it depends how you use them. Anyway, the Bulgarian parliament has ratified yesterday the agreement to provide these to Ukraine together with armament and spare parts, according to the Bulgarian news agency. Now, Lithuania has delivered small arms ammunition, winter equipment to Ukraine. I'm talking about winter equipment earlier. Lithuania has de delivered 3 million units of uh, 762 times 51 mil ammunition, remote detonation systems and winter equipment to Ukraine, according to the Lithuanian Defense Ministry. Here's an interesting one. North Macedonia has completed the successful training of the first group of Ukrainian servicemen. The country will continue training the Ukrainian military through 2024 and as long as there is a need for it. So fantastic. North Macedonia, not some one you'd expect to be uh, to be turning up there to do that kind of stuff so really great news spanish 120 mil mortar shells manufactured by the spanish company expal are in service with the defense uh, forces so the ukrainians using spanish mortar bombs here excellent they need um, as many mortar bombs as they can get their hands and well actually this brings me on to eu countries are considering buying ammunition for for Ukraine from countries outside the EU, Politico has reported. Such an option will be considered, but if EU countries fail to produce ammunition by the promised deadline. Okay, this is interesting because I thought this was already happening, but it appears to have not been happening. So the idea was the EU pledged a million uh, ammunition shells over a year to Ukraine. And then there's been this issue where they've only got 30% of them delivered after half a year. Are they going to be able to fulfill those that pledge by the end of the end of that year france was one of the countries at the beginning of saying we don't well and you can understand why they would say this for their own kind of financial and for the eu's financial interests we want to produce all of that ammunition inside ukraine and france were, were quite strong on that so that yeah we're giving stuff to ukraine but it's again it's this positive sum game again we are helping ukraine and that will help us strategically and in terms of national security. But also we are going to use our own companies to produce that ammunition so we get um, an, an increase in employment and we get the tax revenues and so on and so forth. Okay, so then that goes over to Ukraine. However, the, the EU production capabilities or capacities, sorry, are, do not match that pledge. Uh, it appears. And I thought France had already backtracked and said, OK, we can get uh, ammunition from out outside. That was talked about. I thought uh, as agreed upon. Evidently, it wasn't agreed upon. But it looks like they might well be going down that route now to make sure that they do get the million rounds to Ukraine in the year. OK. Uh, lawmaker says Ukraine is to operate F-16 jets in late spring 2024 in a best case scenario. So Ukraine could field F-16s by the end of spring, um, according to Alexandra Ustinova um, in an interview with Pravda. Now, that would be, so what do we have? February, 
uh, so winter is <laughs> December, January, February, and you've got March, April, May. So that's the end of May. Best case scenario, end of May. Not, you know, the, the people were touting spring and then there was talk about it could be expedited and it was looking like it could be March. No, it's looking like May, at least according to that source. Right. Talking about uh, Holland, and we will go into Gert Wilders getting most of the votes, 35 seats in 150 seat parliament uh, later in the next video. But Michael Weiss here says, bad news for Ukraine as Wilders is against Dutch security assistance, which has been sizable and it continues to be sizable uh, given what we just heard from Ramstein. So does this challenge that it does going forward in the future, but it's probably going to be okay for six months because it might take that long for a coalition to form. There's some serious wrangling to be done. And even though the Wilders has the highest number of seats, his party, PVV, there that's 35 out of 150. And actually the, the there are so many, because of probably proportional representation, there are so many parties with... Uh, parliamentarians that actually it's going to be difficult for him to form a coalition because no one really wants to go into into power with his party right okay going on ukrainian kamikaze boat the magura v5 has unfortunately another one's been found washed up here this is a second recorded case of uh, a one-way marine drone failing uh, to to uh, detonate and falling into the hands of the Russians. This has been found off the western coast of Crimea. Um, talking about drones, the Russians report from the field that Russian forces have begun receiving modified lancets with thermal images that can operate at night. This is a massive problem, and I showed you Andrew Perpetua's uh, sheet from yesterday, and most of the things on that sheet, uh, his, his loss uh, sheet, most of the Ukrainian losses were as a result of nighttime Russian drones. And that's not something we've seen before. This is a new capability. I mean, it's not a new capability, but in that kind of scale, it's a new scale of, of Russian nighttime drone attacks. And that is a massive concern to the Ukrainians. The boys note that recently there's been an intensification of Russian nighttime drone activity practically throughout the last week. So that, again you know, talks to what Andrew Perpetua, what, what his sheet showed. Well, the statistics tell a story, right? So every time we look at these things, I'm trying to look at what's the story here. Oh, right, we're seeing loads of this and we've never seen this before. What does that mean? And it means in this case that the Russians have uh, a weapon that can do the Ukrainians an awful lot of damage and they've got a lot more of those weapons than they previously had. Right. Russian parliament has passed a budget with a record military expenditure. The Russian parliament passed the 2024 budget that increases military spending to more than one third of total government expenditures. Russian independent media outlet Medusa reported today more than one third. So all of Russia's money that they're getting in, more than one third is being spent on the war, on military expenditures. And actually, you could probably expand that because I'm sure that all sorts of other expenditures will be spent as a result of the war. Things like, um, I don't know whether that would include health care provision, mental health care provision, uh, you know, prosthetic limbs and amputations and physical health care for, for the war. And then, I don't know... Uh, I presume compensation payouts will, will come from that budgeting, but there'll be knock-on effects to society that will be as a result of the war that will actually go beyond that third of the budget. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it just goes to show what a bad decision I think Putin's choice to invade Ukraine really was. Uh, thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. I'm going to get on with the geopolitical video next.